Oh, good evening, sisters and brothers. What a simple but powerful act of dependence on God expressed in that song. Without faith, without our depending on God, well, he can't be glorified and we cannot be edified and strengthened. So let us continue to pray. Our Heavenly Father and God, we pause once again in your wonderful presence to give you thanks that in you we live and move and have our being. We give you thanks for having brought us here. We give you thanks that long before we reach here, you were here because you are everywhere. We are trusting that as we meet like this, we will not leave the way we came. We will be better off. We pray for those who might be coming that you may bring them safely and quickly. We continue to pray for our country, for Jamaica land we love, that you may speak to every single person made in your image. Draw them closer to you. We pray for our region and our world. You see how troubled we are. And if we understand your word properly, things will get worse. So we pray that you may strengthen each of us with might in the inner man so that we'll be ready for each day you have afforded us. Thanks for listening to us and guide us now in our session for Christ's sake. Amen. This evening, we want to take a look at the Great Tribulation, which I'm calling the retribution. Last week we looked at the rapture. But to receive rewards, especially in the light of what the elders in the book of Revelation did or will do with their reward. They will cast their crowns at the feet of Jesus, saying in effect, Lord, we really don't deserve this. You are the one that deserves everything. So we are looking forward to that, a time of review. And it shows that our God is a God of justice. He reviews and reappraises believers and unbelievers. So I want to begin by looking at a slide that in a sense would help us to review what we did last week in terms of the coming of the Lord, the rapture in particular. So I don't know if we could look at that slide right now. How we should live in light of the rapture. I, I, I don't believe we'll be going through the Great Tribulation, but even if we are, which I doubt, we still need to find out how we should live. Our main focus will be the book of Revelation, after we have looked at the slide. And while we are waiting for it to come up, let's turn to the book of Revelation, and then when the slide comes, we can always return to it. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 6. Now, just a little idea as to how the book of Revelation is put together. In chapter 1, verse 1, we are told that this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And that means that the book of Revelation is primarily a book about whom? About the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the main key to understand and interpret 
the book of Revelation. If, when you go home or tomorrow, you look at Luke chapter 24, you would see a lovely scene of the resurrected Christ speaking to whom I consider to be a husband and wife team on their way home in Emmaus, not the one in halfway tree, or used to be in halfway tree, the real original Emmaus. But they were dejected. They were coming from Jerusalem. And why were they de de uh, dejected? Because a man was crucified. The one on whom they had rested their hopes. And the Lord, in his resurrected state, said to them, Well, I'm Tono. And they said to him, Duh, you don't know what is going on. He said, Tell me now. And so they told him. And then he said to them, Oh boy, <laughs> you people are not using your heads. You are not using your heads. It was prophesied in Scripture that the Messiah, the Christ, should suffer and enter into his glory. And uh, he gave them an Old Testament lesson, pointing out that everything in the Old Testament points to him. And then when they reached home, they said, well, it's evening. Just spend a little time with us. And what did he do? He went in with them. And please bear in mind now that the Lord is a guest. And he went into their bread pan, took their hard old bread, and began to break it. Oh, it's the Lord. And you know what he did? He disappeared. And you know what they, they did? They went back to Jerusalem. About six miles, six, seven miles away, I think it is. And reported to the other believers that they had seen the Lord. What's my point? The entire Old Testament in one way or the other points to whom? Our blessed Lord Jesus. And the book of Revelation is like that. It's really about, it's a revelation of an aspect of the last days with the Lord Jesus Christ in proper focus. So in chapter 1, we have a focus on him in symbolic form. His head looked like a dread, some people would say. And out of his mouth coming a, 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 three, a two edged sword. And each of those symbols points to an attribute of the Lord Jesus Christ. The sword symbolizes the word of God. And then I think in chapter 1, um, verse 5, we are told that right now, well, back then in the first century, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he ascended, began to rule over all the kings, all the presidents and prime ministers of the world. Now, we don't fully understand how he rules. We don't fully understand um, some of the decisions he makes. But we are confident that Revelation 1 and verse 5, coupled with 1 Corinthians 15 and I think verse 25, that the Lord is reigning behind the scenes. When you come to chapters 2 and 3, we see the Lord Jesus Christ moving in the midst of the churches, seven third churches in Asia Minor, what we call today Turkey. And he begins with Ephesus. And he commends them for the engagement in Wednesday night meetings, prayer meeting, Sunday school, and the like. But he says, I have one thing against you. You have left your first love. You have left your first love. So there's a slide we've been looking at. We're waiting for the return of the Lord. We'll come back to Revelation. And um, how should we then live in the light of that return? We should what? Watch. It's not yet on the screen? Okay. We should watch. And I'm glad some of you look back to watch. Uh, many years ago, anybody here from Carmel Gospel Hall apart from my wife? Anybody else from Carmel Gospel Hall? Well, one Dr. Noel Aiken is a founder of Carmel. 
And um, in about 1972, after attending Assembly Hall Camp, we invited him to be the speaker at our camp reunion in St. Thomas, the Uwe Beach in St. Thomas. That was the first time I was listening to him. And he told the story of a father in the month of July, promised his son that he would buy him a watch. The father intended to give the son the watch during Christmas, but he didn't tell the son. Just that he promised him the watch. And almost every week, the son reminded him of the promise. And the father says, if you mention the watch one more time, you won't get it. So, just around November, the son discovered a verse from Mark 13. I think the last verse, verse 37. So, Daddy, look at this verse. Read it aloud. The father read the verse, and the verse says, What I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. <laughs> and of course, that's an eschatological verse, end time verse. And Uncle Noel said, each of the letters helps us to watch. Watch your words, that's a W. Watch your, what's your A for? Action. Attitude or action, okay. What's the T for? Thoughts, that's right. And <laughs> Jenga people, if you watch your thoughts, then you will watch your words. Our thoughts come from the heart. The C? Watch your companion. Kind of distances myself from certain sinners, you know. Watch your companion. <laughs> and what's your H for? Heart, uh, that you, you could use heart if you want to do that way, but I think it's habits. Habits. And um, later on, I found out something about the word habits. You want to spell habits for, for me? Habit, just spell, spell habit. H A B I T. That's right. If you take off the H, you'd have a bit left. If you take up the B, still have what? It left. Okay, of course, the way to deal with it is to take out the I. <laughs> deal, yes. Okay, so, and we are to be ready. How should we be ready? Well, last week, what did we see? We looked at 1 Thessalonians 4, and um, there's a verse that says that we are to encourage one another with these words. What words? The words about the Lord's coming for us with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. The Lord's coming uh, for, um, with our sisters and brothers in heaven. And they, the spirits of the departed will be reunited with a brand new body. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. We also look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 about the nature of the resurrected body. And the last, is it the last? I think it's the last verse says to us that we are to be what? We are to be steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So do your cooking, do your working elsewhere, but make sure that the primary thing on your mind is the work of the Lord. In other words, that's how we are to get ourselves ready. And um, we are to serve. We are to serve. That's what the transparency says. And I'm looking at, I'm looking at a group of guys serving the Lord. And uh, when I was appearing this slide, I remember in John chapter 13, the Lord washed his disciples' feet. Remember that? Well, these guys, they serve the Lord, sometimes with smelly socks. But they are still serving the Lord. Okay, Christian ambassadors, their new name is Kafu. Kafu, you know, is the last Brazilian captain to have lifted the Jews' remain trophy. Kafu, Christian ambassadors, footballers, united. 
They use their feet to serve the Lord. And uh, we are to use all of us to serve the Lord. Could you look at the next slide? Well, okay. Ooh. Not as visible as I thought it would be, but it's Daniel's uh, contribution to the series. And um, the focus of the slide is on chapters 2 and 7 of the book of Daniel. In chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, modern-day Iraq, at least in the southern part of it, had a dream, and he could not interpret the dream. Now, he had several people on his pay list, hired men who would interpret dreams for him. But the, on this one occasion, he gave them, he, made a, he gave them a request. He said, listen, if you can tell me what I dream about last night and tell me the interpretation, I'll be happy. Now, that's the first time he's coaching the question like that. Normally, you just call them and said, I dreamed this last night. What is it? Like in Jamaica, you go to some Jamaicans, I dream about coffin. Them says what? Wedding. And I dream about wedding dress. Them says burial. You know, yeah, kind of sad thing. But on this occasion, like the Lord gave Nebuchadnezzar that wisdom. They couldn't interpret it. So what did he do? He said, listen, you say, if you don't interpret it, all of you know, are going to kill all of you plus wives and children. And those were in training. Guess who was in training? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and others. And so Daniel and his companion came together and prayed. And God gave them the answer. In the dream, he saw a head, a statue with a head of gold. Breastplate of silver. I think a six-pack was bronze. And a little later on, what? Iron. And Daniel gave him, said, said to him, Sir, the head of gold represents you. It represents not just the king, but the kingdom of Babylon. And uh, the silver represents what? Superpower. The Medes and the Persians. Which, what's, what, what we now call Iran. A modern name. And after the Iranians will follow what nation? No, Greek. The, uh, Greece. The Greek nation. Greece. And this will be followed up by the Roman Empire. But it doesn't end there. At the end of his vision, he saw a big stone coming down out of heaven. And it fell on the feet of the statue. And the entire statue was destroyed. That's significant for us. Amen? Because that stone represents our Lord Jesus Christ. He will succeed all the kingdoms. Uh, a little later on, I did some research. What kingdom um, succeeded the Roman Empire? It was the Ottoman Turks. The Ottoman Turks, the, uh, the Muslims. The Muslims. And after the Muslims, what uh, kingdom succeeded them? The British Empire. It is the greatest empire the world has ever seen in terms of its comprehension, um, comprehensiveness. And that's why the statement came up, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Everywhere you go, you, go, you went in those days. If you go to South Africa, them dead there. If you went to India, them dead there. The sun never sets on the British Empire. So, we know which kingdom is coming after. The big stone is coming to replace all those kingdoms. And that stone will be there forever and ever. So, that slide is really about uh, Daniel's uh, dream and how it should be interpreted. In chapter 7, a similar outline of these successive nations um, is there. Last slide takes us to Revelation. I don't know if you could find that. Now, 
As I was going through Revelation earlier, I mentioned that everything about the book is relates to our blessed Lord Jesus. So chapters 2 and 3, we find the Lord moving amongst the churches, and that's applicable to us. I think that every church, every year, should read from these letters. You might want to make it twice a year, because as I said, the first letter was to the church of Ephesus, and he commended the church, and he said, but I've one thing against you, you have left your first love. And I'm guilty of that sometimes when I'm speaking to sisters and brothers, you know. So I used to witness. How oh, came here, Christian? You used to. As long as we live, we should be witnessing, amen? I used to go to the prayer meeting. Of course, we know some brothers and sisters, uh, early they can't come out. But we are here to serve. And we are to continue to serve until we are met either by the upper taker or the undertaker. That's what the apostle Paul said. I will serve him until I die. I will only mention the last letter. The letter to the Laodiceans. And it shows uh, a degradation. Uh, a going back, a departure of the churches. Even in the first century. Because in this church, the church of Laodicea. The locked out Jesus. Now there's a verse there which we know quite well. Revelation 3.20. Behold I stand at the door and knock. And I've heard that verse used many times in an evangelistic setting. And many people get saved. Is it wrong to use that verse? No. But the interpretation of the verse is that the church had locked out the Lord Jesus. Now if, you, if I come back here next Wednesday, God will not lock me up. Let's go back to my yard. And kiss my teeth. But the Lord is a loving person. Instead of leaving just so, 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 him knock. So anyone inside this church want to come out to fellowship with me at Burger King? I want to talk to you people. I want to draw you closer to myself. So that's the interpretation. But what our evangelists do is not wrong. The application. You see the difference? The application. So they say, the Lord is knocking at your heart's door. And people come forward. So the Holy Spirit is interested in interpretation, but is also interested in what? In application. Then in chapter 4, chapters 4 and 5, we have a heavenly scene where John is taken up and um, he sees angels and four living creatures, angelic beings. And in chapter 5, he sees the throne of God. And the Lord Jesus Christ is there as well. And a, a book is opened. A scroll is opened. And what I was told when I attended Midland Bible Institute, that, the, that this scroll is actually the title, deed of the earth. You know, you have a piece of land, you have a title. Well, this scroll represents the title. Who is the rightful owner of this earth? Of this earth? And the scroll was opened... But there was no one found to, well, before it was opened, no one found to, 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 to open it, to break the seals. And since John, the writer of the book, knew the significance of the seal, he put on one piece of barley. And an angel came to him and said something. Now, let me tell you my interpretation. hope you'll accept me uh, next week, God willing. The man who came to John and said, I know he's willing to open the seal, is one Robert Nesta Mali. Just before he died, he made a profession of faith. The day before, or maybe the same day, in Miami, before he actually came to Jamaica. And I said to myself, you can call my interpretation, who best to identify the person to open that scroll than a farmer raster man. So someone's going to come to John and say, Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. And after the seal is opened, all hell will break loose on earth. And that we come to chapter 6. Because, you see, if I have a piece of land in St. Elizabeth, and after 21 years, I go there and I see squatters 
I see gambling, all kinds of sinful things happening. What am I going to do? Of course, I'm going to give the squatters some notice. And then I'm going to bulldoze the land. Not you. Because I want to erect what I want to erect. Maybe a church, a football, field, whatever. And so I see from chapter 6 to chapter 18, a bulldozing of the earth. After the seals and the bowls and whatever, the trumpets. It's a bulldozing, a refurbishing, a refitting, retrofitting of everything. And it's called the Great Tribulation. So could you look at um, Revelation 6, 1 to 17, if you, if you have it. And... Uh, And those of you with Bibles, could you just turn to it? Revelation 6. Could I get a volunteer to read from verse 1, please? Just stand right where you are. You could sit if you want. Where's the roving mic? Who will volunteer to read for us? Yeah. Yes, 1 to 17, that's right. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Hum! And I looked, and behold, a white horse and his rider had a bow and a crown was given to him and he came out conquering and to conquer when he opened the second seal I heard the second living creature say come and out came another horse bright red his rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another and he was given a great sword. Okay, just stop here for a moment. So first, what color horse? White. White horse. Now there are some interpreters who will tell you that this horse is actually written by the Lord Jesus. No. That's in chapter, in chapter 19. We will see the Lord. But these horses called by Billy Graham and others, these are the horses of the apocalypse. They are all judging or agents in judging the world. And you will notice warfare and the like. So the Lord, the Lord is a way of using everything bad sometimes, like stones. Well, stones are not necessarily bad, but He uses things in our universe to judge us, including stones, including sun, you name it. Okay, continue reading. Thank you. When He opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and wine. Yes. Stop there, for, stop there for a moment. Remember now, we're now in the Great Tribulation, starting from chapter 6. And this part of this verse is saying to us that things will be scarce. However, although things are scarce, there'll be items that rich people like won't be touched. Won't be touched. Wine and the like. Not that there'll be an abundance of those things, but they will be preserved. In other words, once there is any even pandemic or difficult times, economic times, it is the poor people that suffer more. The rich will have something extra to buy them over, not for eternity, 
but for maybe a year or two more. Continue reading. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, and with famine, and with pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. Wow. And pale horse is another translation of this word, pale green. So first, what horse? What color horse? White. And then what? And then which horse? Yeah, pale green. And this horse will, or horseman, will kill with the sword, with hunger, and the like. And death, and the beast of the fields, the beast of the earth. Continue reading. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Yeah, thank you. Now, you see, once you get closer to the Lord, you begin to have questions. Not that you want to judge God, but you, Lord, how long? These are saints in heaven, praying, their soul, their spirits. How long? It has been 10 years now. It has been 100 years now. 1,000 years now. How long before you get even with the, the Muslims? With the Americans? The Jamaicans? How long? And God's answer is not the best answer from our perspective. Just wait until more of your kind are killed and join in heaven. <laughs> because God knows that for the believer, sudden death is what? S sudden glory. And it's a question we need to contemplate, you know. Because there are times when, if I hear about a raper, I hear about somebody or some of the government officials stealing, I want them, them to judge what? No! And God comes to me and says, Delan, you're sure you want to be judged right? I said, yes! I said, but Delan, how about your sins? Would you like me to judge you every time you have a bad thought? Sometimes I think about myself. So many years ago, I gave this illustration. And I take it seriously. If God were to judge me every time I have a sinful thought, and I allow it, I entertain it for five seconds, ten seconds, doesn't matter, but I entertain it. And while I'm entertaining, God shocks me. Says my head sat, you know, like that. Seriously. Can you imagine I'm up here preaching and I shake up my head? I go outside and say, Lord, I do fish messages, you know. I do fish messages. Come back here. So, the point I'm making is, if God were to judge sin the way we expect to be judged, none of us come to church. Because I would turn to somebody I said, hey, see Brother Simpson had a shake there. I'm oh, sorry. No, I said, <laughs> so God is patient. He's patient. Why is he patient? Because he wants us to recognize when we have a bad thought and confess that sin. If God were to judge corrupt people, I don't think it's only politicians would die, you know. I think some church people too, like Ananias and Sapphira and Delano. So the people say, Hold on, O Lord. But we have to trust God's wisdom. One of the things I, I'm impressed with scripture 
is the wisdom of God. We know, we know that God is all-knowing. Isn't that so? But he's not just all-knowing. He knows how to use that knowledge to the best of his ability. Because let's go back to, quickly before we go back to Revelation, to the first book of the Bible. The first person to have died was a righteous man. Amen? Now, if I were God, the first person to die was a bad man like him. Seriously. To make everybody know, say, listen, I'm a just God. But the first righteous person is king. And I said, why? Why? Well, here's an answer. God wanted Cain to repent. He wanted Cain to repent. I don't know everything about God's wisdom. But I understand the question of these people. How long, O oh Lord? You're taking too long, in a sense. Remember John 11? When Jesus got a telegram from Mary, your friend is sick, unknowing, unknowingly, the sister Martha sent an email, your friend is sick, and the Lord showed them the two pieces of communique, and he tarried, waited for many days, four days, and when he went south, guess what? Lazarus dead long time. Bury long time. And put on one piece of ball in. I hear my question. But Lord, if you know, say, you go wait, where are ball for? And them dry his tears. I said, show him where he's buried. And you raise him from the dead. Here's the wisdom of God. God in that text did not want to heal Lazarus. He wants to what? Raise Lazarus. So I, it helps me in my prayer. I, 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 I pray many times in my prayers, but it helps me to think about the Lazarus situation. Let's continue reading. Um, verse 12. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. So, um, you know, during the Q&A, I'm anticipating a question. What has happened to Jamaica? See the verse here? All the islands will change places. So Jamaica is in prophecy right here. All the islands. Of course, I think it has happened before, you know, but please bear in mind that the judgment we are seeing in chapter 6 to 18 is unprecedented and unparalleled. This is a time about which I spoke when I said things will get better, but it will get worse. And Jenga people is unimaginable. We cannot imagine sun turning black. Can you imagine consternation on earth? Let's go to chapter 8, starting with verse 2 to 21. When you have time, just read the rest of Revelation. I'm leaving out some verses, but I'm taking, I consider to be the worst ones. In Revelation chapter 8, 2 to 21. It'll be the same volunteer, not our next person could continue reading. Revelation 8, verse 2 to verse 21. Revelation chapter 8, verses 2 to 21. Yes, thank you. Reading from the Nesby. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and the seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel came and stood at the altar, holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him, so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and threw it to the earth. And there followed pearls of thunder, peals, sorry, of thunder and sounds 
and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. The first sounded, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood. And they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second, the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of waters. The name of the star is called Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many died from the waters because they were made bitter. The fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars were struck, so that a third of them would, would be darkened, and the day would not shine for a third of it, and the night in the same way. Then I looked, and I heard an angel flying in mid-heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Um, that's verse 21. Yeah. That's verse 13. So it ends. O okay, I was looking for a verse in chapter 8 which shows the response of the people who are being judged. Uh, Okay, I could tell you what it says. The people knew, let me repeat, knew that they were being judged by God. And what was, what was their response? Well, before I, I tell you their response, why do you think, what response do you think God wanted on their part? What kind of response? Repentance. Right through the, the Old Testament, New Testament, once God is about to judge, especially in the book of Jonah. And if the people repent, he changes his mind. But this set of people, instead of repenting, they cursed God. They knew that God was judging them. They looked up to heaven and cursed God. I just find it strange in one sense. But it shows of the human heart. The heart is deceitful and wicked and incurable. They refuse to respond positively to Almighty God. We will stop here for a moment and uh, take some questions. Um, just, just before the question, in Revelation 13, 1 to well, 16, the same thought. You can go and read it. Same thought of people responding to God. Cursing, cursing God. Sister Carl. What? It's chapter 9, verse 20. Okay, thank you. Could you read it for me? I got the wrong here. Chapter 9, verse 20. Anybody? Thanks very much. Sister? Chapter 9, 20. Chapter 9, verse 20 says, yeah. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshipping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Thank you very much. Now, Jenga people, this is not talking about the first century, you know. Those things were rampant. It's talking about possibly the 21st century or the 20th. It doesn't matter. People are worshipping demons today in Jamaica. There's a church of Satan in Jamaica. People, when we're not about the murder, murder is mentioned. They don't repent of their murder. They worship what? Gold. And that's why in our first session, 
we looked at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Men shall be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure. And that's the main reason why people will be judged. If we go back a little bit to John 3, 16, we all know it, don't it? Let's say it together. For God so... Continue. Okay, what does verse 17 say? Okay, verse 18. What do those verses say? He, listen carefully, he that believes is not condemned. As simple as that. But he that believes not is condemned already. For what reason? Because he has not believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So nobody is going to go to hell because he's a good man or a murderer. For one decade reason. A failure to trust Christ as personal savior. Now, once they fail to trust him as personal savior, they will end up in the wrong place. And they are murders, worship of de worshiping of demons, all these things. Just like in a court of law, you know. Once you are found guilty, that's when your previous crimes are brought to bear to deal with your sentencing. How long you stay in the lockup. Of course, this lockup, we didn't go uh, to chap well, chapter 20, maybe next week God will look at that. But the saddest verse to me in the Bible is Revelation 20, verse 15. And all those whose names are not written in the book will be cast what? In the? But why will we cast in the lake of fire? Because they have not believed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we need to keep on preaching the gospel. Because just the belief in him gives salvation. John 3, 16 says, He that believes will not what? Perish. The word perish means go to hell. It also means in a secondary sense, go through the tribulation. He that believes is, will not perish, but have right now eternal life. It says everlasting life, but it's the same thing as verse 15, eternal life. So there's a gift that we receive the moment we trust Christ as personal savior, which is eternal life, which is the life of God, which is quality life. Everybody has forever life, you know. But some will spend their, spend their forever life in up north, and others will spend it down south. So every angel, every human being. So when John 3.16 promises everlasting life, and John 3.15, eternal life, it's talking about the quality life that we can live. That verse is just read every time I think about it. People will not repent of their murders, their worship of, of, of demons, their sexual immorality, whether it's homosexuality, you name it. They prefer their lifestyle than to receive salvation. Question, comment? While I think of your question, um, a sister approached me last week just reminding me of a very important thing that I think I'd said it before, that when we look at these prophecies, the most important response on our part as children of God is to ask the question, how does this affect my lifestyle? And we, early on this evening, we looked at First Thessalonians 4. We also look at First Corinthians 15. Be steadfast and move with always abounding in the work of the Lord. The book of Revelation is kind of strange in that the application for the most part, um, comes in the first part, in the first, uh, in the second chapter and the third chapter, how we should live. Repent. Those who of us who have left our first love, we can't lose it. We have to repent and remember and out of love for Jesus do the first work. So if I used to witness, out of love, I, I, I return to that expression of love uh, of the Lord Jesus. And... Um, Read through all the letters, the seven letters, and you see the application. Because 
It's not just about judgment, this book. The first part talks about application, but chapters 6 through 18, the judgment on the earth. And the last two chapters of the judgment uh, uh, sequence has to do with the judgment of the economy and the judgment of the uh, religious situation. Okay, and Satan will be big, big. That's when uh, people will be taking the mark of the beast. And you cannot buy and sell unless you have this mark of the beast. Any questions? I have one I will pose before. See if you don't have it. Pose before. And the ten plagues uh, that God sent on Pharaoh. Yes. And on each occasion, he still refused, refused to let the people go. And then you uh, narrow it down to the thief on the cross. Yes. Two occasions. There's a one on the left and the one on the right. One, one says, we are suffering for what we do, but this man has done nothing amiss. And he appealed to Jesus for forgiveness. The other man, well, we don't know what happened to him because he hasn't said anything yet. And I'm assuming that he never repented either, even when he was faced with eternity at that moment. Yes, yes, yes. Human nature remained the same. Yes. And I think of Judas having the best teacher ever. <clears throat> twelve, he had many disciples, but there's twelve special disciples. And uh, at the end of the day, Judas must have said, I thought this school was accredited. I want about my money. And he sold his mass for 30 pieces of silver. Of course, he felt bad afterward, but feeling bad is one thing. There's a chapter, 2 Corinthians 7, talks about godly repentance. Godly repentance, uh, godly repentance leads to joy. Uh, godly sorrow leads to repentance, and repentance leads to joy. Okay? But there's another bad feeling that people get. And it leads to death. That's what the, the, the text says in um, Second Corinthians chapter 7. Maybe 9 and, and, and 10. That leads to death. And I remember Judas. So there's a verse who said he felt bad. But he hanged himself. And the same thing with um, Saul. Saul felt bad. Saul, the Old Testament Saul. That is, he felt bad. And he asked an armor bearer to kill him. And when the armor bearer thing refused, he killed himself. So we have to make sure that the sorrow we feel is a sorrow that leads to repentance. And I said repentance leads to joy based on um, what is it, Psalm 33 or something like that where David talks about the joy of repenting. After about a year he failed to confess his sins. Okay? We want to make sure we follow scripture. We follow the word of God and repent. And you know the Christian life is one series of repentance. The repentance that we confess in God's sight, whether inwardly or what of you, is to restore, not relationship, because God remains our father, we remain his children, but to restore what? Fellowship. There are, there are some Christians who believe that, you know, if you sin too often, you will lose your salvation. But to lose your salvation, it means that God is no longer your father, don't it? And uh, suppose you repent. Are you born again again? The Bible speaks about one of it. So one last question as we close. Uh, come here. Yeah. You mentioned about um, the church will not go through the tribulation. Yes. Or the great tribulation. And so there are three uh, we, uh, we speak about the, the, the rapture as in pre-tribulation. Yes mid-tribulation, post-tribulation. Why is there those differences? Why? Why do we have these kind of beliefs? And what scripture is there, would there be for talking about mid-trib, pre-trib, or post-trib? Okay, uh, good question. But first of all, let's address the, just a seven-year period. Uh, a, a sister reminded me or informed me that it came from the book of Daniel. Okay. You know, Daniel, I think, 70th week. So, the tribulation that we looked at in Revelation, from Revelation 6 to 18, right, will take place during that seven-year period. But it will not be a seven-year duration for the tribulation. Be a, the first three and a half years will be a time of peace where the... 
This is after the rapture. Yeah, after the rapture. Okay. Sorry, that's it. Thank you. Sorry, it's after the rapture, and um, well, <laughs> that's my view because you know, I'm yeah, are mid, and those who believe now that he will come back at the end of the seven years are post tribulationists. Now, I'll put my neck on the block for one thing: Jesus is coming back. No, I'll, I'll actually die for that. But I, won't, I will not die for my pre-trip view. Now, it doesn't mean that it's, not my, con it's my conviction. But there are certain things we have to realize that, you know, if brothers this, uh, have different views, three different views, and uh, some of them are very, very bright, sisters and brothers, I will not. But nobody can. If they say, Delano, if you, do you believe that Christ is coming back? Because if you don't, we can't. I won't kill you as I kill me. Because I know that sudden death is what? Sudden glory. So I am a firm believer. And what's the difference? The difference is really three and a half years or seven years, you know, period. But I don't think we'll be, go we'll be going through the great tribulation. I think there's a verse in Second um, Thessalonians that says that God has not appointed us to wrath. God has not appointed us to wrath. Okay? But it's, it's, it's important, and thanks for bringing it up, that we know that there are three views. In fact, there are actually even three or four views as how to interpret Revelation. Okay? There's one view called the Preteris view. And it says that everything you read about in Revelation took place in the first century. Preteris view. You don't have to remember the fancy name. And there's another view called the Historis view, which means that everything you read in Revelation started in the first century and continues to the 21st century. <laughs> so, so it's really a way of mapping out church history. You know, the first hundred years or so, nice. Second hundred years, problems or, or millennia, whatever, I don't know. Problems and the like. And um, the other view, what's it now? I can't remember the fancy name for it. But um, they believe, oh, the future's view. That's there, the future's view. That from chapter 6 to chapter 18 is still future. Okay, so the first, in chapters 2 and 3, first century. It's clear it's first century because Christ is writing to the seven churches in Asia Minor, what we call Turkey, Ephesus and the like. But from chapter 6 to chapter 18, um, we, that's a future's view from the standpoint of the writer. Okay? But, younger people, the important thing is, it's not so much the whole of you, but to remember that every single day we are to serve Christ. Amen? And live as if he's coming tonight, but plan as if he's coming back for the next ten year, in the next 10 years. So there's nothing wrong to plan, but live at the other time. You know, look, honestly, I don't like the COVID period, but what I found out about my experience is that once I live a day at a time, day at a time I'm at peace. I only feel troubled when I start to worry. I say, oh boy, you know, uh, will I get enough money? Will my bank account run out? And, it's, and the Lord said, why are you thinking about these things? You must think about it, but why not live a day? Of, and once I live a day, I'm at peace. I'm able to read my word of God, have devotions uh, with my wife, and just go about my business Taking the promise of Philippians 4, uh, verse, um, very seriously. Worry about what? Nothing. And pray about everything. And the peace of God, which passes what? All understanding. You know, you can't fully explain it, but when I, 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 trust me. When I pray, even a small prayer, a peace comes over me. And I ask myself a question, Delano, why don't you pray more? That's what we must do. That's an application. Thanks. We have gone beyond. And next week, we'll be looking at the new heaven and the new earth. That's mentioned in Revelation as well, chapters 21 and 22 and elsewhere. The new heaven and the new earth.